Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the show Immigration and Settlement with Faryal Hussain. We are now doing episode eight. A great response to the last episode, which was all about uh, parental sponsorship. And you do recall that during uh, the e-transmission, e-transmission ke dauran, ek sawal pucha gaya tha ke immigration ke liye agar age aapki 40 se zyada ho gayi hai, to kya options ho sakti hai? Lekin wo eid ki transmission aur wo chaap aur gosh khane ke chakra mein wo sawalo ka jawab mein de nahi saki thi. Mein socha ke kisi aise shaks ko bulaya jaye aaj show mein, jo ke is baat ka jawab dein ke 40 plus age agar ho jaye, to kaun kaun se dwaze immigration ke khule hain? immigration ke liye. Aap show dekhe hain Settlement and Immigration on Voice of Toronto TV. It airs every Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Aap isko Facebook pe bhi dekh sakte hain aur YouTube pe bhi dekh sakte hain. Aaj mere saath jo jo guest hain, inka naam hai John Burke. Mr. John Burke jo hain, main aapko pehle Urdu mein batati hoon and then I'll explain in English. Mr. John Burke jo hain, wo a regulated immigration consultant hai aur lekin meri tarah unhone Canadian government mein bhi kaam kiya hai. काफी साल काम किया मुझे बताते नहीं है कितने साल लेकिन काफी साल काम किया इनकी आ, काम की नोयत कुछ इस तरह थी कि वर्क परमिट से पहले का जो स्टेप होता है अप्रूव करने का एलएमआई को अप्रूव करने का उस डिपार्टमेंट को ये ऑपरेशनल मैनेजर के तौर पे काम करते थे सो नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस माय गेस्ट मिस्टर जॉन बर्क थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग ऑन द शो ऑल द वे फ्रॉम रिचमंड हिल ऑल द वे फ्रॉम रिचमंड हिल थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर फॉर हैविंग मी एज अ गेस्ट ऑन योर शो थैंक यू फॉर अ प्लेजर थैंक यू अम एक्चुअली द रीजन आई आई हैड वांटेड यू टू कम इन इज टू एनलाइटन अस ऑन व्हाट आर द ऑप्शंस फॉर समवन हु वांट्स टू मूव टू कनाडा बट दे हैव पास 40 इयर्स ऑफ एज दे मे नॉट क्वालिफाई अंडर द एक्सप्रेस एंट्री प्रोग्राम you have the expertise to uh, to enlighten us so you have the expertise like myself from the government side being on the other side of the desk and being on the side of a regulated consultant yes i do yes. i've had a fair bit of experience uh, with the government department that we now know as service canada when i was with them um the last name that they had when i left was human resources and skills development canada uh, my role with them i was uh, very heavily involved in the temporary foreign worker program mm -hmm. at both the regional level here in Ontario and at the national level uh, out of the national headquarters in Hull. So I spent uh, 14 years working on uh, the uh, temporary foreign worker program. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of work in manufacturing and construction. Um, I was uh, really the go-between, the contact for all the major construction unions, the electrical trade unions, the machine trade unions, uh, and the major manufacturers. I right. uh, had the pleasure of working uh, directly with all of the Japanese auto firms, Toyota, Honda, mm -hmm. uh, even Hyundai at one point uh, from the South, the, the uh, Korean automaker. But um, I worked with them in the establishment of the, the manufacturing plants here in Ontario. So over the years, I gained a I would say an in-depth experience of uh, business management, uh, corporate strategy, right. uh, how the how the manufacturing sector and the construction sectors work. So, when I left the government and went into private practice as mm -hmm. a consultant, um, that was the skill I carried with me. Except right. I started to do things on the other side of the, the other fence. side. Yeah, the other side exactly. of the fence, just like myself. Well, so. That was ages ago. Like how how long ago was that? Ah, uh, actually, telling tales out of school here. I left the government in 1996. 96. And uh, so I've been uh, practicing privately as a consultant and as an advisor, an immigration advisor to a number of uh, immigration law firms here in the city in Toronto uh, since that time. So, um, so, so over these years, like, what have you seen? How have you seen the foreign worker program evolve from from the beginning of when you were with the government until you left in '96? It's um, to put it very simply, I've seen a lot of changes. Some very good, and, and some not so good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think what what what's missing sometimes is. And I hate to use the term facilitative, but sometimes government needs to be facilitative when it comes to helping the economy. Right. And 
people don't realize just what a contribution the foreign workers make to our economy. Absolutely. Um, as you know, there is a process uh, out there called the labor market impact assessment process, which employers have to go through in many cases before uh, Service Canada will give them permission to hire a foreign worker. Now, there's nothing wrong with having that kind of protection for the labor market in place. The difficulty comes through when it's administered and it's how it's administered. Uh, a, an officer who understands the big picture will take a look at all of the variables. And if they see that there clearly would be a benefit to having that job occupied by a foreign worker, then they should be approving the application for a labor market impact assessment, or LMIA as we call it. So, um, too often I've seen situations where the officer lacked that foresight, that they, they kind of had their police or protector hat on. And instead of looking at, say, the benefits that putting a foreign worker in that position would have in terms of transferring a skill that might actually be not that easy to find here in Canada right. to Canadian workers, because it, that benefits the worker from the standpoint of of being able to have that skill, mm -hmm. to use it in their employment with that employer, or should they have to go on to another employer to be able to transfer that skill. Uh, that I think if, if I have a criticism, that would be it. Yeah. You know, it would be about looking at the whole picture, looking at it, rather than just crossing I's and dotting T's as to whether or not um, the application was filled out right to the letter, whether you know all of the advertising was exactly as it should have been and so on and so on i mean they have so the I rules think, that's fine so i think i think it's important that uh when the application goes in the lmi application all the aspects are looked at it's not I, just one i think from but also from the standpoint of an employer or a consultant working with an employer to do it knowing that that, that application is going to be gone over with a fine tooth comb it's incumbent upon the employer or the consultant representing or lawyer mm -hmm. representing the employer to make certain that all of those I's are dotted, that all of those T's are crossed. And that really what you want to do as, as an authorized representative is to make the job of that Service Canada officer easy so that they can say yes without having any difficulty in doing I that. I have a feeling that we'll need a separate show, a whole separate show for the LMIAs. I'm at your, <laughs> whenever you would like, I, I will try to make myself available. And I think that, that we've talked briefly before, there are a number of areas. We're only going to touch probably on uh, a small part of it. You, you were asking about my background. That's probably yeah. where a lot of it comes from because exactly. I was on the other side. So having been on the other side and now on this side to help us with applications for clients who want to move to Canada with them, with their families for a better future, or they want to move their business to Canada. So that's the question today, that if someone has a business background or has a business or has a business profile mm -hmm. and they want to move to Canada, they don't meet the requirements because of their age, the point system. So what are the other options? And in particular, the business owners or if they want to establish a company here in Canada. Just enlighten us on mm -hmm, mm -hmm, one of the mm -hmm. options and quickly what the process would be. Well, the, the primary option that I look at in, in that sort of situation is it, something that you call the intra-company transfer. Mm -hmm. Now, that necessitates that there be a, an operating business overseas, of course, because uh, the criteria is that that business be in operation and that they're setting up a could be a branch it could be a subsidiary company here in Canada and they want to transfer uh, one or maybe more than one key person or personnel uh, into Canada to basically basically get the new operation up and running right and and the business in the home country has to continue to operate so it can't close down yes that is correct because if if, if it doesn't continue to operate you don't have the basis for a transfer that disappears with that other company disappears so 
So, he, so yes. it's very important that the company continues. So here's a question that I get all the time. Sure. And I know the answer to this, but I want to hear it from you. <laughs> okay. Is this a viable option for business owners? Yes, it's a very viable option for a business owner. Um, there are different ways it can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the difficulty is establishing that the business owner was in fact employed by his or her business. Mm -hmm. Because that is, that is an eligibility criterion, that the individual to be transferred has to have been employed by, it, by the company overseas for at least one year in the three years preceding the application. So, some people aren't employed and there it becomes an issue. Do we look for a way to make them employed? Make them employed, wait a year until they've got the one year of actual employment under their belt? Or is there another way that we can look at? So, so you know, there, there are different ways to get the company established. It's the individual we're talking about. So I guess about. the question is, what is employed? What is the definition for IRCC? What is the definition of employed? These are very, yeah. there are a lot of nuances. I think it's not fair to be able to answer all these here, but just briefly, what document would constitute you know, proof of one year employment? Uh, in a situation where you're talking about the company, the person who actually owns the company, we would have to be able to show that that person was on payroll, that the official payroll records to mm -hmm. indicate that he was in fact or she was in fact employed by the company. Um, normally, I would prepare um, letters of attestation, if you like, to confirm the employment. But when you're dealing with somebody who is also the owner, you want to be very careful how you portray it because uh, immigration could look at it and say, well, this person's self-employed, they're right. not. Right. And that's the thing that you need to avoid. Yeah, it's a very important point yeah. and, and, so. and we will uh, ponder this a little more after the break. So uh, if you haven't taken down notes yet, please grab a pen and paper. For all your loved ones who do want to move to Canada, they have a business profile. आप उनको ये इनफॉरमेशन दीजिए मेरे नंबर भी स्क्रीन पे आ रहे हैं जॉन के नंबर भी स्क्रीन पे आ रहे हैं आप स्टूडियो uh, में भी फोन कर सकते हैं ये बहुत जरूरी है कि किसी भी एप्लीकेशन की अंडरस्टैंडिंग सिर्फ एप्लीकेशन के फॉर्म तो कोई भी फिल कर सकता है लेकिन एप्लीकेशन फॉर्म्स को के साथ सपोर्टिंग डॉक्यूमेंट्स क्या लगानी है एंड मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली क्या नहीं लगाना इसके बारे में बात करेंगे ब्रेक के बाद हमारे साथ रहिएगा मुस्लिम वेलफेयर सेंटर के जरिए आप पाकिस्तान के रेगिस्तान में प्यासों को पानी पिला सकते हैं गरीब बच्चों की तालीम और माली परवरिश कर सकते हैं बीमारों का मुफ्त इलाज करवा सकते हैं जकत सदकत या फिदिया देने के लिए आज ही हमें फोन करें वन एट सिक्स सिक्स सेवन फाइव फोर थर्टी वन इलेवन A harsh but true reality is that clean drinking water is inaccessible to many people living in third world countries. With the support of our donors, Muslim Welfare Canada has been successful in providing clean water through the digging of water wells and the installation of hand pumps for people living in remote and desert regions. Donate a well or a hand pump call 1-866-754-3111. or visit mwcanada.org Muslim Welfare Canada has made a concerted effort to lead the fight against child labor, poverty and illiteracy in third world countries through the generous support of our donors. Both girls and boys receive free, good quality education. Help educate a needy child for just $1 a day or $30 per month. Donate generously. Call 1-866-754-3111. or visit mwcanada.org. 
Since 1993, MWC food banks have provided individuals and families with non-perishable food, halal meat, and essential household items. We have a special focus on the needs of our children. Over 10,000 families across Canada rely on MWC food banks to supplement their food requirements. We serve in Scarborough, Mississauga, and in First Nations communities in Ontario, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. Your generosity can literally change lives. It's time now, more than ever, to look after your neighbor. Charity starts at home. Please donate generously to Muslim Welfare Canada Emergency COVID-19 Food Fund. Call 1-866-754-3111 or visit mwcanada.org. Welcome back after the break. Or we are talking Mr. John Burke se regarding options for immigration. If you have business experience, or you have any kind of business experience, and you want to immigrate here with your family. Ke so once again, thank you for making time for us. So we were talking about the ICT program, Intra-Company Transfer. That means that one company through someone will transfer here. To be transfer to be an employee. So it's very important that the person that's transferred or is being transferred is an employee. That's correct, Ariel. If, if I might add to, to that part of it, there, it, it's also important the type of position the person holds in the foreign company, mm -hmm. because that position has, actually has to be either at a senior managerial level, or it has to be one that can be categorized as having specialized knowledge. So on top of the one year in the previous three, you also have to look at what is the kind of position and they have to be coming to Canada to fill the similar type of position. Similar position. Wow. So there are a lot of little nuances. There, that there, are, there are many things that a, a representative uh, such as yourself or myself uh, would have to look at in working with the employer to file this application in the best possible manner. So, so filing the application, what exactly would the process be for an ICT? Uh, there are a number of questions that, that we would have to ask as a, a representative. Mm -hmm. um, there is a process that has to be, uh, it's actually a separate application that has to be made on behalf of the employer in relation to filling that job to make sure that immigration is okay with it before you go forward with the the final submission of the application. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's basically a vetting of the job in advance. And uh, that once that's done, you're assigned a number to identify that that process has been done mm -hmm. and that can then be used with uh, the formal application itself. So, so when you're saying uh, that job, so just to clarify, uh, there is a business in the home country and that business wants to open up a branch or a subsidiary in Canada and to start the operation or to establish the, the new company, they would send somebody of a higher manager, somebody with decision-making abilities. That's correct. Yeah? They, they would, in essence, the first person who came over would most likely be uh, the name and face of the company right. in Canada, in the right. Canadian operation. So, yes, they have to make, they have to have the de decision-making authority they have to have the authority to hire new people because, of course, you know, Canada's looking for benefits here. And one of the benefits, one of the easiest ones is, is that creation. To, yeah, create employment for right. uh, Canadian workers. And so, so, it's, so, it is, so it is essentially a win-win situation for the, the, the foreign company and for Canada as it, well. It, in my opinion, it's probably one of the best approaches mm -hmm. that we have out there. Now, it's not suitable for all cases. Sure. Uh, as we'll probably talk at another time, mm -hmm. there are other ways of, of helping businesses get here or people who have businesses. 
But this, to me, is, I think, one of the better approaches. So, just to clarify, the ICT application would not be a permanent resident application. It's a two-step process. It's a two-step process. This, uh, the intercompany transfer application is for the purposes of getting a work permit. Now, once the person is here and uh, the business is somewhat established, then you can look at going for permanent residency. If, some, in some, if, if you want if to. That's the, if that's the objective, yes. That's now, in, in the majority of cases, it tends to be, but there are some others. As I said to you, I work closely with the Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. Japanese companies like their people to come, stay maybe three years, maximum five years, and then go back. So to them, I did a lot of intercompany transfers with uh, the Japanese manufacturing companies, but most of them returned. I, um, I can almost hear my viewers thinking of a question and I can telepathically, <laughs> I know exactly where it is. So is there any restriction of the country from which the company can transfer? Is there any restriction? Because I think the main thought was probably it's only meant for transfer from the U.S. to Canada. No, not at all. Um, U.S. and certain other countries, there are trade agreements right. that are in existence. So. You, you can use those as the basis for the intercompany transfer. But for countries that aren't subject to a trade agreement, there are what they call the general regulations of the Immigration Act and regulations. And it is those parts that allow the use of the intercompany transfer for countries other than those with which Canada has trade agreements. So as I always say, knowledge is power. Knowing that there's no such requirement, there's no such restriction of one country or any uh, preference of another country, it is as long as the requirements are met. It's the meeting of the eligibility requirements that is the key, mm -hmm. yes. Perfect. So what exactly are the benefits of the ICT program as opposed to other? Well, one of the, one of the key benefits in my mind is that the ICT is part of the International Mobility Program, which is run by immigration alone, mm -hmm. which means that there is no requirement for a labor market impact assessment from Service Canada. Right. And that makes it a much simpler process. Now, yes, I mentioned to you there was a job vetting application that has to be done. It's a little bit like an LMIA, but it's not the same as an LMIA. Right. So actually, just to... Um clarify on this fact that the main, main benefit is that there is no requirement to go through the LMIA process. Correct. That, that's a the, primary benefit. Which means the advertising and the job matching and all that, you don't, do, you don't need to do that because it is strictly a straight work permit application Correct. under the uh, Global Mobility Program. Correct. And that is a huge benefit. It's a large benefit for it many, is. many people. Yeah. It is. Because you don't have two doors to knock on. You have no, one it's door. It's all done through one door. Mm -hmm which uh, in itself is, as you say, a large benefit. Yeah. Any drawbacks to the um, ICT, if any? You know what, I, I, I'm trying to think of the experience that I've had, whether I've found it. I quite honestly can't think of a, a drawback. If, if the, cri the eligibility criteria are met on the corporate side and on the individual side, mm -hmm. No, I, I really, other than the fact that in, uh, in the situation it's a two-stage deal where the first one, well, not two stages, actually three stages, because you get a work permit initially, and uh, but some people will be in a situation uh, whereby they'll have sufficient points to apply for permanent residency very shortly after they get here. That's truer of people in the senior management and executive categories where they may be allowed 200 points for yeah. the position. Yeah, so as I said, so. another show yeah. Yeah. With, for LMIAs, that's going to be on the board, right? Yeah. Um, I can almost sense another question my viewers are telepathically sending your, your, to me. Your telepathic sense is working overtime. Yeah, yeah, right? de de definitely. De well, it was a long weekend, so oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so would the applicant come alone? Would he or she come alone? Or can they bring their family? How soon can they bring their family? What benefits, what rights, what, uh, you know? There are situations, and, and it, it's difficult to categorize as to which might be where, but mm -hmm. it is possible to do either. Mm -hmm. To either have the principal applicant come forward 
alone, mm -hmm. get established, and then bring the family forward. Or, in some cases, it makes more sense to have everyone apply at the same time and they all come forward. The caution that I have there for most people mm -hmm. is that from the immigration side, this is still a temporary entry program. So ties to the home country are going to be very, very important. And if the whole family's coming and there's nobody left overseas, that could potentially be a problem area. Because it's, what are the ties? Exactly. So um, it's a fine balance between one of the 12 objectives of immigration, which is family reunification, keeping a family together, and then assessing if this temporary foreign worker is indeed a temporary foreign worker and their intent is to remain here temporarily. So I think this is why you would need the assistance of someone who has the experience, preferably for both sides of the table, mm -hmm. to assist with the application. This application is very important the application ke applicant ko samajhne ke liye unke profile ko samajhne ke liye unke intentions ko samajhne ke unke family unit ko samajhne ke liye ki application ko kis tarike se kiya jaye mr john burke ke numbers aapke screen pe aa rahe hain mera number bhi aapke paas hai aap unse contact kar sakte hain agar aap apne kisi loved ones ke ya family friends ke aap unke bare mein jana chahte hain ya information lena chahte hain okay so um the, the family would come here as visitors or would they have any status or the spouse can work children going to school going to, yeah. what what will they do okay. just um if if and when the family come and this doesn't it doesn't really matter whether they're coming uh, all together or whether they're coming at a later stage uh, the wife or I'm going to use the, the term spouse, spouse the spouse because I was watching I, was I know I'm, I'm just looking at you and thinking I better be careful <laughs> um, no the spouse is eligible to work there is, uh, is no I mean the, obviously that's going to be dependent on the qualification level of the position that the principal applicant holds. But right. most of these people coming forward are going to hold positions that will qualify the spouse to work. So that's generally there. As far as attending school is mm -hmm. concerned, if there are children involved, uh, children who attend either or will attend either primary or secondary school, regardless of age, mm -hmm are allowed to do so on the strength of the principal applicant's work permit. They do not require study permits to go to primary school or to go to secondary school. If they're coming to a post-secondary level like college or university, then yes, a study permit would have to be acquired in order for them to continue studying in Canada. So if it's not post-secondary, then they would not be paying any fees. They would just come here, school year starts, and they, they would basically be accepted into the public school system mm -hmm. uh, and allowed to attend classes, be it at primary school or, or at secondary level. And also, um, once they're here, they're not stuck here. You can come and go. Oh, yes, because they would, they would be here mm -hmm. um, as visitors, but attached to the work permit of the principal applicants. It does sound like an excellent plan for anybody or any employer who wants to send an employee to set up shop here. So that's the key, so sending an employee. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where uh, somebody like us would come in to make the assessment to see if it's feasible or not. Numbers up your screen, please note. In my last question is, the processing time of an ICT application. What are you looking at generally? Um, again, you, you have to look at where the application is being processed. So it's because not processed here? Generally, no, mm -hmm. it would not be. Um, as you know, they're done, the applications are done online, but often that application will end up going overseas to the country of residence from which the individual is applying. So much would depend on the processing times of that particular visa post. Mm -hmm. uh, I generally tell people, should be able to do it between eight and 12 months. Eight and 12 months. Now, and, and that's an outside figure. Right. I like, I like to 
have a bit of room. Mm -hmm. If it comes in at less than that, so much the better. Um, I, I've seen them done in as little as six months, but I would not say to somebody, oh, six months and we'll have it for you. That's, uh, that's going too far. You do recall we had one that took two weeks, remember? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I recall that. But I would consider that one essentially a very an, an anomaly. Yeah. And it was a special situation. It was a special yes. situation. No, this is great information. And um, we have just touched, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It means other information uh, business immigration. Uh, John, thank you for being here. I'm going to be speaking in Urdu and uh, the My other pleasure. languages. Uh, so I, bear with me. That's quite all right. Please, I'm very pleased you asked me. And uh, I might be inviting you in the coming weeks uh, to touch upon other programs as well. That's, that's quite all right. Uh, there are a lot of others that you've just said yeah. to your audience. Uh, this is only touching the iceberg. Yeah. जी अब एक छोटा सा मैसेज जाने से पहले आपको याद होगा कि पिछले वीक मैंने बताया था कि पेरेंटल स्पॉन्सरशिप की जो ड्रॉज हैं ये दोबारा स्टार्ट हो रहे हैं ट्वेंटी सितंबर से ट्वेंटी सितंबर से लेकर फर्स्ट अक्टूबर अगर आपने अपने पेरेंट्स को स्पॉन्सर करने के लिए या ग्रैंड पेरेंट को स्पॉन्सर करने के लिए एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट फाइल किया था अपने ई का जरूर ध्यान रखिए स्पैम फोल्डर जंक फोल्डर कीप चैकिंग दोज फ्रॉम द डेट्स ऑफ ट्वेंटी सेप्टेम्बर टू द फर्स्ट ऑफ अक्टूबर हो सकता है उसमें इनविटेशन आए और इनविटेशन का टाइम जो है वो दैट्स गोइंग टू बी 60 डेज जिसने आपने जवाब देना होगा एंड देर इज़ अ कॉन्फर्मेशन कोड अगर कॉन्फर्मेशन कोड आपसे खो गया है उसको भी कैसे चेक करेंगे वो मैं आपको नेक्स्ट प्रोग्राम में बताऊंगी आज के लिए इतना ही अपना ख्याल रखें थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस एंड स्टे सेफ एंड दिस इज़ फराउस एंड विद इमिग्रेशन एंड सेटलमेंट एंड वॉइस ऑफ टॉनो टी वी गुड नाइट